Our scripture for today is from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 to 26. Again, it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 to 26. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. May God bless the reading of his word. I have the privilege now of introducing a long lost friend. You see, uh, Ed and I are old. We were on the original Facebook. <laughs> Before it was on a computer, we, you would come to campus and you had your picture put in this little book. And that's why it was called the Facebook. <laughs> and if you look through this Facebook for a nominal fee, I'll let you look at it later, because we're raising money for student scholarships and everybody's gonna wanna see what I'm gonna look at right here. I go through the K's and I say, oh my gosh, David Kazarian. I turn the page, there's another Kazarian, and then John Kiefer, and then Stephanie Kiefer. Ed Kazarian, there he is. My gosh, his hair was black. He had a beard. And it says that he lived at 296 Essex Street. He likes sports, music, he's conservative Baptist, and he appreciates evangelism and discipleship. That's faithfulness, that's steadfastness. When I came back to the campus here, I visited Ed's church in Danvers, First Baptist Church in Danvers. He took me aside and said, we've been praying for you every week, right? Before I even came here, when that was announced that I was gonna be the president, my old friend, Ed, had been praying for me at his church. I was overwhelmed. Ed is the real thing. The reason I selected him to be the speaker here is because he's one of the most beloved teachers at Gordon-Conwell. He's nursed many people through Greek, helped them uh, through tutoring and sitting in the cafeteria. He's one of the people I see sitting with students most lunchtime. And it's not wasted time when you have time with Ed. Ed is a unique person in his compassion and care for students, his understanding that truth and love are a, are, are a double helix in the Christian life. And so he speaks the truth, and he's a man who deeply loves uh, his students and as well as fellow faculty. Ed also is a dancer. He dances uh, what, on a monthly basis with his creation uh, dance troupe. And um, he's danced here and led us in worship. He's a preacher, he's a New Testament scholar, and Ed, we are honored to have you deliver God's word tonight to us. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sunquist. I'm going to preface my remarks by just a personal word about Dr. Sunquist. When I was uh, a young naval officer, I had God's call on my life to come to seminary. And there was a man that was very influential in Singapore. Canon Frank, um, what was his name? Canon Lomax, yes, thank you. Canon Lomax. Very important man in my life, sensing the call of God. There is only one other person in the world that I know of that knows Frank Lomax and that's Dr. Sunquist. So that was a bond for us when he first came. Let me share with you some words <clears throat> from uh, Jesus and from Paul. 
as we look together at ministering in the midst of suffering. It was 37 years ago this very week. I was a year out of seminary and working as an assistant pastor at a church here in Massachusetts. I heard on the radio that Francis Schaeffer had passed away from cancer at the age of 72. Schaeffer was a leading Christian philosopher in the latter half of the last century. His writings, like those of C.S. Lewis, essentially uh, defined evangelicalism. And he taught generations of students, both in Europe and North America, how to think Christianly. I listened intently as the announcer asked Schaefer's son, Frankie, if his father had given him any final words of advice before he passed away. Yes, he said, just two things. Don't sleep with any woman who is not your wife. And live now as you will want to have lived when you are where I am, looking back on your life and preparing to meet God. There's something especially poignant and gripping when one who has nurtured you and trained you in the faith, facing his own imminent death, shares with you his last words on the essentials of life. We find several examples of this in scripture. For me, the two most uh, intimate and moving accounts are Jesus' last supper with his disciples and Paul's final letter to his young protege, Timothy. Not surprising, both accounts share common themes. Both Jesus and Paul are passionate about truth. Both insist upon sanctification as essential for the ongoing work of ministry. And both are looking forward to the glory that lies ahead. But what seems to weigh most heavily on their hearts is the intense suffering that their disciples will face and the urgency of preparing them to endure it. It seems fitting then as all of you finish seminary and head for a variety of different ministries, to listen again to Paul's last words to Timothy on serving the Lord in the midst of suffering. Truth be told, I wanted to entitle this message, Serving the Lord in Unprecedented Times. Doesn't that sound relevant? Just as we were taught in preaching class, You prepare your sermons with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. But I just couldn't use that title. First of all, it just isn't true. These are not unprecedented times. They may seem that way to us because we've never personally experienced anything like this before. But not unprecedented. If we could go back, even just a century, and see for ourselves all the devastation of natural disaster, disease, injustice, and the brutal inhumanity within the human race, we would be shamed into silence for any claim that our suffering is unprecedented. Secondly, these so-called unprecedented times are not unusual. They are the norm. This is the nature of life in a fallen world, a world that God loves, a world that Jesus came to save. This is also the nature of incarnational ministry. The Savior entered into the world and participated in its suffering in order to open the way to truth and eternal life. At the Last Supper, Jesus told his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed 
you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Similarly, Paul reminded Timothy, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. As Timothy's role model, Paul continued, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I say reminded Timothy because Timothy had heard this from Paul before. In his letter to the Philippian church, Paul writes, for it has been graciously granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. In his last words, preparing Timothy to serve the Lord in the midst of suffering, not only the suffering of his people, but also the suffering that Timothy himself must face in his ministry among them. Paul addresses three concerns in Timothy's life. His engagement with scripture, his pursuit of sanctification, and his demeanor as a servant. In each of these areas, Paul expects Timothy to rise above circumstances, to overcome shame, and through the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit, to stand honorably and unashamed. In contrast to those who have swerved away from the truth, Timothy is to exemplify the proper handling of scripture. In contrast to those who have been seduced by the godlessness of the age, Timothy is to exemplify righteousness and purity. In contrast to those who spawn contention and controversy in the community of Christ, Timothy is to exemplify kind, gentle, patient correction. In his engagement with scripture, Timothy had a long and honorable heritage. His mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois were both believers, and so they raised him in the faith as well. Knowing that scripture was the foundation for faith, they exposed him to it. Not from childhood, as our translation says, but from infancy. Timothy may only have become aware of it during his childhood, but once the bond was established between Eunice and her baby, scripture became a part of his life just because it was a part of her life. And it was a part of her life because it had also been a part of her mother's life. What Eunice had learned from her mother Lois, she likewise imparted to her child Timothy. Paul reminds Timothy of that heritage and then urges him to build upon it for two reasons. Scripture is a trustworthy source of wisdom and faith. The truth of scripture will keep you one from being deceived and swept away by the lies and schemes of those evil people and pretenders all around who claim to have the truth but betray that claim by their ever-increasing godlessness. Secondly, scripture is essential to the character and conduct of the Lord's servant. In his pursuit of sanctification, Timothy already had a tested and proven character. Paul commends him to the church at Philippi. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, 
He has served with me in the gospel. Despite Timothy's proven character, Paul reminds him that to be fit for the master's use, to be set apart as holy, to be sanctified, one must be purified from all that is dishonorable. And there are two sides to that coin. It's just like changing clothes. One side is what you take off and discard, and the other side is what you put on and keep. On the one hand, Paul reminds Timothy to flee, to run away from youthful passions. The word passion can have a positive nuance of longing or deep desire. Or it can bear a negative connotation of lust, envy, covetousness, or selfish indulgence. It all depends on the object or the goal of the passion. Often in scripture, it bears a negative connotation, the desire for something forbidden, or the uncontrolled desire to indulge the bodily appetites for food, drink, and sexuality. It is this negative sense that Paul has in mind, for these passions are dishonorable and thus to be discarded. On the other hand, Paul also reminds Timothy to pursue, to run after righteousness, faith, love, and peace. These are all honorable passions, well suited to the servant of God. They should be eagerly sought. This is not an arbitrary list of virtues, but rather virtues essential to Timothy's leadership. In a context of false teaching and conflict, leading to more and more ungodliness, the authenticity of one who claims to worship God is marked by the readiness to abandon unrighteousness and the eagerness to pursue righteousness. The servant of the Lord must be unequivocally committed to righteousness. In a context where faith is assaulted and systematically dismantled, the servant of the Lord must have a stout, durable faith that can withstand the assault. In a context where disagreement over foolish and ignorant arguments fracture the harmony within a community, the servant of the Lord must possess in abundance the two distinguishing marks of a Christian community, love for one another and peace with one another. However robust Timothy's uh, pursuit of sanctification may have been, it had to be an ongoing process. And it was not meant to be done alone. Timothy is to join with all the others in the community who are like-minded in their devotion to God, who have turned away from iniquity, and who are seeking God in purity of mind and heart. In his demeanor as a servant, Timothy faces perhaps his greatest challenge. Just as Paul addresses the formation of Timothy's character by giving him something to avoid and something to embrace, so too in addressing his conduct. Quarreling is so antithetical to the character and conduct of the Lord's servant that Timothy is to avoid quarreling and anything that leads to it at all costs. On the other hand, Paul enjoins four positive qualities that are to govern Timothy's disposition and behavior. Kindness, the ability to teach, patience without resentment, gentleness when correcting. While maintaining each of those qualities and allowing them to inform one's behavior is daunting enough, 
The greater challenge probably lies in owning the identity of a servant in the first place. We are informed by the lexicon that the Greek word denotes a slave or a bondservant. Although slavery in the ancient world was different from slavery as we have known it in our own history, they do share this in common. The slave was not free. A slave could not do whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, wherever he wanted, however he wanted. The slave was not his own, he belonged to another. The slave was subservient to and controlled by another. Some were born into slavery, others were made slaves. That made sense in that culture. People had categories for that. But what made no sense at all was someone who was free choosing to become a slave. Freedom was so highly valued that it would have been nearly inconceivable that someone would ever give that up. But whether we translate it as servant or slave, that was the identity that Paul chose for himself and for Timothy. For Paul, this identity was simply one of the ramifications of calling Jesus Lord. As for those four qualities, kindness, ability to teach, patience without resentment, and gentleness when correcting, they are required of the Lord's servant for two reasons. First of all, this is the master's own example and thus his will. And secondly, this is the best approach to achieve God's redemptive purpose in this situation. Let me explain. The root problem that threatens the character and conduct of the Lord's servant lies in the ignorant controversies. And the remedial response of the servant is to be gentle correction. Will you excuse me for one more lesson in Greek before you leave? There is an elegant word play here between the word for ignorant, literally untrained, and the word for correct, literally train. They share the same root. The Lord's servant is to respond to the untrained by training them. But this is also an adversarial situation, requiring kindness, the ability to patiently endure without resentment, the ability to teach, and the utmost gentleness when correcting. The servant of the Lord intentionally seeks the transformation in both character and conduct in order to fulfill the wishes of the master. The servant's hope is that God will grant the adversaries repentance and lead them to a knowledge of the truth. The reality is that the adversaries are in a snare of the devil. They have been made slaves of the evil one. They are under his control and forced to do his will. Only God can spring a trap like that and release them. But that's the hope of the servant of God. In all of this, we come back to scripture as the primary tool in the servant's work. As Paul was reminding Timothy of his heritage in scripture and encouraging him to build upon it, he concluded with this statement. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Did you hear that? Breathed out by God, that's the servant's authority. Effective for training in righteousness, that's the servant's sanctification. 
profitable for teaching, reproving, correcting. That's the servant's curriculum for the adversaries. All of us who confess Jesus as Lord are his servants. As you go from seminary, you go into a world of suffering. Follow Paul's advice to Timothy. Stay engaged in the scriptures. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Express kindness to all. Teach well. Endure suffering without resentment. And be oh so gentle in correcting and training. May God bless you as you go from here. As the old saying goes, well begun is half done. Live now as you will want to have lived when you are looking back on your life and preparing to meet God. The Lord bless you.